for our first program today. I'm super excited to have a Dr. Claudia Garcia Lewis coming to us all the way from San Antonio, Texas, y'all. Um, so big ups to Claudia. Um, we'll be doing a talk on rupturing the black and white the binary, Afro-Latina, Afro-Latino, Latinx, or Afro-Latinx, bridging the black and brown divide. Um, this is my sister, love her to death. We went to grad school together and she's gonna drop some knowledge. So show her some Highline love, y'all. Buenos dias. Love it. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Doris um, and I go way back. I, I actually grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in Hood River, Oregon. How many of you have heard of Hood River? Woo, yeah! It's a small, small farm working community, but I wasn't aware that there was going to be middle schoolers here, and let me tell you, I am so excited to have you all here, and so I'm gonna try to tailor my presentation to you all, if that's okay with everybody else, because I think the importance of education is also empowering our youth to believe in themselves and to understand who they are and how they can be the change. And so I will read some things, but then I will, I will, um, Re, re, um, tell them in a different way so that it's, it's so our younger audiences can understand. Um, Do we have a clipper? I can clip this. Oh, okay. Yeah, or I, can, or I can come back. It's fine. That's George. So I have a presentation set up, and as a Latina, um, what ends up happening is that I have a presentation set up, and sometimes I go off cue, and so I, I ask for you all to just bear with me. This is a process that has taken me years to arrive at. So I wanna start off with my positionality. And so what positionality means is who I am, how I stand in the world, and how I see the world. And so I wanna start off by the first, uh, the first bullet point, which is my birth name. I was born in Mexico, in Yahualica, Jalisco, uh, close to Guadalajara. And one of the most important things about ourselves is our name. However, when we immigrate or when we go to communities that don't speak our language, they often take away our name. So I'm, my name, my birth name is Claudia Garcia Medina. That honors Garcia, my dad's family. Medina is my mother's family. And so in the Chicana feminist tradition, we like to honor the legacy of our family. And so I'm going to honor my parents. I am the daughter of Maria del Consuelo. Medina Jimenez and Jose Ascension Garcia Gomez. When I went to school, I went, so I, I immigrated as a farm worker, grew up in Hood River, and so in school they couldn't say Claudia Garcia Medina, so guess what? It's too long, right? So they said, let's take away the Medina. So I became, Claudi I became Claudia Garcia, but it was really hard for some people to say Claudia, so they would call me Claw. I became a Claw, right? And so when they did that, what ended up happening was that it took away my identity. And so I use that now as an educator. I have the tools, I have the knowledge, I have the strength to be able to push against that. And so you saw in my name, it's Garcia with an accent. And I always tell my students, I'm not Garcia, I'm Garcia. If you don't know how to use that accent, make sure that you figure it out. And so for my young students, if, you're, if your name is a name that isn't in English, honor that because there's so much attached to that name, right? And so my presentation today is honoring that I'm a Mexican immigrant. It took me a really long time to acknowledge and celebrate that I'm Mexicana. Um, I used to lie and say I was born in LA because everybody wants to be born in LA, especially if you're growing up in Hood River, Oregon. So I would say, yeah, I was born in LA. And I would make up these lies and lies that I wanted to so deeply believe because I was told by society that because I was Mexican and I was a foreigner, there was no way that I would be successful and I was completely opposite of what success meant, right? And so I want, now I feel pride in being a, a Mexican immigrant. I am the third oldest in my family, but I'm the first to graduate from high school. My two older siblings were pushed out because their education did not make them feel welcome. They didn't feel welcome in classrooms. They weren't taught um, to be proud of who they are. And so I am not lucky to be a first gen student. I fought for it. And so for those younger ones, for those of you who are on, who are on campus here at, at Highland, I want you to also understand that this has been a process of generations. And so me being a doctora, a profe, is a, is a dream come true, not only of me, but also of my family, right? So it's carrying through the legacy of my brothers and sisters who have been pushed out of the system. And so I come to you, my positionality is embedded in that. It's embedded in struggle, it's embedded in being a mother. So you'll see my, my two little munchkins right here. 
my daughter, Victoria. Um, my husband is Haitian. He's first, first generation born in the US from Haitian family. So we're a family of immigrants. Like we really are immigrants, right? And so we are the dreams and the hopes of our parents. And so my daughter is dressed as Frida Kahlo right here for, for Influential Women's Day because she understands that she is a synthesis of both, right? And so my research and the way I come to this research is not because I said, wait a minute, Latinos aren't just people who look like me. There's black Latinos, there's Asian Latinos. It was because it was born out of me being forced to see that my children would someday have to fight for their right and their identity, right? And so I come to you in this way and I want to start off with my positionality because as a mestiza woman, as a Latina who presents as a Latina, doing research on Afro-Latinidad is something that I'm always conscious about. I'm here rather than an Afro-Latina being here or an Afro-Latinx individual talking about Afro-Latinx issues. So I wanna make sure I start off with that positionality and to make sure that um, I, I'm honoring the, the gifts and the experiences and the stories of my participants. And so my research, my dissertation was inspired by my children, my children who are Haitian. I came up with that term, it just fits, you know, they're, they're Haitian and they're Mexicanos, so they're Haitians, right? Um, and so what I uncovered was that within higher education research, there was no scholarship on the experiences of Afro-Latinos. And so I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and when I watched Univision, all I saw was blonde-haired, blue-eyed people, people who were lighter than me, and so I thought that that was the representation of Latinidad. I thought those were Latinos. When I went to college, I got on an airplane and went to Venezuela. And when I got off in Venezuela, I was in Caracas, I looked around, and it was this sea of Afro-descendientes. I was so confused. I thought I had gone to the wrong place because I had never been made aware of the fact that there are Afro-descendientes, Afro-Latinos in Latino America. And so, um, but I was able to get on a plane, come back, and I didn't have to deal with it because that was not an identity that I was forced to live through. So we conveniently forget to think about items because if they don't, if, if I am able-bodied, then it's really easy for me to forget about people who don't, who have some type of physical limitations, right? So it wasn't until I became a mother and started doing research on Afro-Latinidad that I said, wait a minute, the voices of Afro-descendientes are missing from higher education research. And so what I found was representation, right? And so when we think about representation within literature, when we think about representation and the voices that are included within literature, I found that there's this notion of anti-blackness within the US and colorism. So colorism is coined by Alice Walker a phenomenal uh, black woman who came up with colorism. And so colorism means uh, people being treated differently based on their skin tone. So the darker individuals are treated worse, even within groups, right? So within the black community, within the Latino community, individuals who have lighter skin, who have more fair uh, facial features, who have lighter hair, tend to be treated better no. because they're, they're approximated no. more. No. We'll have questions at the end and so um, within minor even within minoritized communities, there's also this notion of identity formation. So when we think about identity and we think about identity formation, we have to consider that there is this rich history of slavery. And I say rich because it's so dynamic and complex, but its legacy still persists to this day. And so we see, and even within our own cities, we see how gentrification is taking over in, in communities, but communities that were historically redlined, so they were redlined into being segregated and people, black and brown communities being pushed into these, these spaces. Also this whole notion of the social construction of race, like what is race? Do we know what race is? So we see it on federal forms, right? We see, what are the, what are the racial categories? Uh, African American or Hispanic. black, Hispanic, ethnicity. Others. There's other now, right? Yes. Asian, Asian yes. What else? White. White. Native American. But these are social constructions because if you go to Brazil, they have over 200 categorizations for individuals. Hispanic does not exist outside of the United States. And so that's a social construction grounded within geographic spaces. Does that make sense? Yes. 
if you go, so my husband's Haitian, he grew up in New York. If I, when I would go to New York, they would say that I was Spanish, right? And so geographically, in New York, Spanish was identified as people who speak Spanish, but they were Puerto Ricanos, they were Dominicanos, they were Salvadoreños, they were all sorts of different nationalities, but that was what being Hispanic is. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have mostly, in, when I was growing up in Hood River, there were mostly Mexican immigrants. And so anyone who spoke Spanish automatically was Mexican. So I want us to understand that within the research on Afro-Latinidad and student affairs and higher, er, and, and, and higher education, these were the two things that I identified, was that identity was embedded within the, this complicated history of slavery, and because Afro-Latinos presented black, they presented as black, they were often assumed to be African-American. But my students, the people who I was interviewing, they understood that the legacy and the history of African-Americans was not theirs. And they were very transparent in that process. So I, I will get back to that in a little bit. And so what happens with Afro-Latinos and Afro-Latinidad is that this, they, they, they develop this deracinated identity, which means basically this identity that is truncated, right? Pieces, cut up into small pieces. And it's based on the social construction of geography. How many of you know that there's a Spanish-speaking country in Africa? Spanish-speaking country in Africa. I want to see your hands up high. And so for those, the other people, look around. Very few, right? But what's the name of the country? So for middle schoolers, now you know geography, right? You didn't know you were going to learn geography, but here you go. Equatorial New Guinea. OK. Are they considered Latinos? Why not? They speak Spanish. But Brazilians don't speak Spanish, they speak Portuguese and they're considered Latinos. That's the messiness with the social construction is what I'm trying to get at, is that it's socially constructed and because it's so messy, the lines are often blurred. This, also this notion of literary discursive separation of blackness and brownness, within the United States, if you are black, you cannot possibly be brown. We've identified this time and time again, so Afro-Latinos are are positioned in the middle where they can't possibly be Afro-Latinos. And now it's more accepted with Cardi B being, you know, being very vociferous about being Afro-Latina and what that means, but she also talks about being questioned about that identity. And then also this racialized subjectivity of mestizaje and black Ameri I'm sorry, this racialized subjectivity of being mestizos and black Americans. So what is a mestizo? I like to do, I like to do community participation. What's a mestizo or mestiza? Okay, so mixed. Other people? One more person. What about my middle schoolers? Mestizaje is the number one term that um, Latinos living in the United States adopt. Mestizaje is, uh, and you can go to the next one. Mestizaje is a, is a mixture that comes from this historic legacy. This is a trans, and I'll come back to mestizaje in a little bit because I, I, I define it. Um, transatlantic slave trade, how many of you are familiar with this map? And so for a lot of people, when I do presentations, even when I uncovered this, I was shocked. But when you look, when people were enslaved from Africa and brought to the, to the Americas, you will see that the grand majority went to South America and Central, and the, Central America and the Caribbean. 5% came to the United States. So when we think about Afro-descendants and we think about the descendants of Africans, we also have to expand our definition of what that means and that it goes beyond the United States. Oftentimes we are victims of our own education and oftentimes in the United States it's very US-centric, but we also don't talk about these things. So when we think about Afro-descendientes and we think about Afro-Latinos, it's a huge population and it makes up a great part of who we are within Latin America. So as a Mexicana who presents Mexicana, I wasn't forced to see this. But this is also the background of the PowerPoint presentation. But the Spaniards, they were meticulous record keepers. They kept records on everything. And so one of the things that they developed were castas. And so castas is essentially a ranking of mixtures. 
And so at the top left-hand side, you will see that it was Espanol with a mestiza. And at the very bottom, you can't see it because of the, of, of the um, what's this called? Sub Closed captioning, thank you. Um, it's two black people, Africanos, Afro-descendants, right? And so they began to create this categorization and ranking of individuals. This was in Mexico, where I thought that there were no Afro-Mexicanos. Now Mexico actually counts Afro-Mexicanos and Afro-descendientes. And we actually, and, and you know, this isn't part of the presentation, but I, as I was doing research, I found out that Guerrero was the first black president in the Americas in Mexico. There's a state named after Guerrero. Yanga was a libertador, an enslaved person who ran away from being enslaved and founded the first free pueblo in the Americas, in Mexico. And we, Mexicanos, and I consider myself Mexicana, we erase that history and there's so much richness and pride in that. Our, there, we have a state named Guerrero. So, I started off with my positionality and I like to question things. So I said, but how did we get to the point where we begin to uphold colorism? So remember we talked about what colorism was. How do we get to a point where minoritized individuals, individuals who are people of color, buy into the notion of colorism? And I started asking questions. And the more I looked, dun, dun, dun. Oh, one of the things I wanted to say was also the crown and religion. So the crown of Spain, actually, they funded the exploration into the colonization, into the Americas, into in Mexico. And so that was there was a large religious component associated with it. But um, then I started looking at images of who is a Latino, who is a Latina OX. And so we have Celia Cruz, and we have Cardi B, and we have Elena Ochoa, and we have Amara La Negra, and we have Shusha. And, we have, these are all Latinos. And when you look at that and you say, wait a minute, but that's not a Latino within the social construction of what we have in our head, then I began to question, well, then what is a Latino? Do you have the same question? Because look at the diversity here. And so my research, through my research, I came to find and um, that Afro-Latina OXs are neither biracial nor multiracial as we define them within the United States, but rather a rich amalgamation of historical mixture between Europeans, conquist uh, European conquistadores, various indigenous groups, and also blacks. And so when we think about Afro-Latinidad, we have to then rupture away from what we've been taught about the social construction of, uh, of the the rupture, rupture from the federal guidelines of black, white, indigenous. Does that make sense? So the problem, ethno-racial categories. So ethno-racial means categories that are based on race. So ethno-racial one race categories are grounded and constructed within geographic spaces. So I talked a little bit about how there's there's um, there's uh, black Sicans in California, so the mixture of black and African Americans, and then you have um, and then you have people who identify as Afrodescendientes, you have people who identify as um, Spanish, even Latinos, in, in, in which took me a while to understand, um, identify as Spanish within the within um, New York area. But then you have people in my study. I found students who um, who identified as Garifuna. Right? Garifuna, indigenous native peoples from Central America. You have people who identify um, as mestizos. We have people who identify as mulatto, knowing that mulatto was utilized in a negative term. They identify as mulatto. And so we begin to find people who are identifying beyond the social construction of categories that the federal government has positioned for us. But what we also need to understand is that within the United States, we have this black white racial binary. And so oftentimes when we talk about race relations, it's often positioned from one side is black, the other side is uh, white and black, right? And so what ends up happening is that our conversations tend to stop there. When we want representation, when we want diversity, it's always, well, black people this, uh, white people that. And what has happened is that it has 
created a negative experience for everyone because then representation all in a sudden becomes black when black individuals don't even have a voice in a lot of what happens. Um, also, this racial binary dominates the formation of knowledge. So when we think about education, and when I was doing extensive research, I came to find out that in fact, um, we weren't really talking about the black-white racial binary, but what ends up getting into textbooks and into research was often falling a line, uh, falling along the federal guidelines. So Latino, who's a Latino, I don't know, who's white, who's Native American, who's Asian American. And so these, they also control the formation of knowledge because in order to receive grants, so you all don't know this, but as faculty members, we have to apply for grants in order to do research. And so we have to use those categories. If we decide to not use those categories, we don't get funding very difficult to get funding beyond those categories. So it impacts the way research is conducted and the type of research that is produced. So it limits our ontological groundings and terminology for assessing at the validity of race and ethnicity. That's the conclusion that I came to. So going back to how do we, how does this racial binary, and it, it all ties into MLK, I promise, I promise. I wanted to understand then how is slavery, how was slavery justified? Because as a person, I can't imagine inflicting pain on communities, entire communities, entire villages. And so I said, how do you convince masses of people to do that? And so then I, I did research and I identified um, the, and you know, there's limited text out there, but it's something that, um, I arrived at, which was, there's this curse of Ham. And so the curse of Ham is that Ham walked into his father, walked in on his father, his father was naked, lying drunk, and so Ham walked out and told his siblings that their father was lying drunk, but he saw him naked, and so that was a big sin. His brothers came and walked backwards and put the blanket on top of their father, and that way they didn't see him naked. Well, Ham was cursed by his father. That was the, the, the curse of Ham. The curse of Cain, Cain killed his brother. And so God placed upon him a marker. And so there was this notion of, okay, well, Ham and Cain, they're sinister individuals in history. So there was this narrative that was depicted that said black people were the descendants of both bloodlines. And because there was a mark placed upon them, then it must be black skin. And so that justification was utilized to justify the enslavement of individuals because when it was, it was in a time when the Bible ruled and when the Bible had high influence, and so justification of slavery was passed on in that way. Mestizaje, Jose Vasconcelos. How many of you have heard of Jose Vasconcelos? Okay, so La Raza Cosmica, the fifth race, Jose Vasconcelos was a Latin American philosopher in 1910. Mexico, just like many Latin American countries, had just gone post-revolution and they were finding their independence, but the country was divided. It was so divided that they needed something to bring people together. But they still, the, the Spanish descendants still wanted to maintain control. So what they ended up doing was that Latin American philosophers, Jose Vasconcelos in Mexico in particular, developed this notion of la raza cosmica, the cosmic race. He was a descendant of Spaniards, and he was uh, one of the elite classes in Mexico. So the cosmic race and his philosophy went like this, that the cosmic race would one day rise and be superior than even the white Europeans because they were, a they were a mixture of indigenous, black, and European. And so what would happen was essentially that they would rise to become more dominant. And so a lot of people in the, in, in the United States who are descendants of, Lat of, of Lat Latin America um, or have lineage in Latin America, because there was no identity formation within the United States, they adopted mestizaje as this term, right? Like this idealistic term, I'm going to become like superior. Like everybody wants to be superior. We're gonna become superior. And so mestizaje took on this notion of pride. But what we weren't told is that mestizaje is actually a Darwinian term. And so for my middle schoolers, I know that you know what Darwin, uh, Darwin, who Darwin is, right? Who's Darwin? There's a famous saying, survival of the fittest, right? And so what Vasconcelos believed was that eventually, over time, 
the mestizos would continue to rise, but you would have to breed out the brute, and by, by that definition, he meant black, and also the ignorant, and by that definition, he meant indigenous. And so eventually, what would result was this likeness towards European. But that included the European descendants, the Spaniard descendants that lived in Mexico, and then the Americas. And so in that case, when we look at the definition of mestizaje, when we begin to look at it, it becomes more complex, right? Now it's also a Darwinian term. And so finally going into the colonies and in the Americas, how do we understand racial formation within the United States? We started, I started looking at colonies and what colonies had established as blood fraction statutes. So how many of you know what blood fraction statutes are? Back there. So what is it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> blood fraction, like counting, I'm half this ethnicity, half this ethnicity, or a quarter this, a quarter that, depending on what your parents were and how they identified or how they were identified by others. Yeah, and we've heard the bl one drop of black blood renders you? All the way black. All the way black, right? And so we've heard these things, and so that started in the colonies, and they also had anti-miscegenation policies, which meant that racial mixture was criminal, illegal. And so in this way, just like in mestizaje, the notion of mestizaje, there was the whole notion of the castas, right? Remember we saw the castas where, where European mixtures were at the top and then African black mixtures were at the bottom. And essentially this upheld these, these beliefs, but now through policy. So the legacy of colonization is one large theme that I continue to that I that I continue to look at, and I look at the invasion of the Americas, and this one drop rule is very different within the United States than in Latin America. In Latin America, one drop of Spanish blood got you closer to whiteness, whereas in the United States, one drop of black or of black blood rendered you black. Right? So how do we then tease this out in the context of Afro-Latinidad and their experiences as them trying to find identity and belonging within either category? So it amounted to this loss of identity and family history. So in sla slavery, essentially it ripped apart entire communities, right? Villages were torn apart. But that legacy continues, just like I started off with my name and I said, Garcia is my dad's lineage, Medina is my mother's lineage. We are able to trace back who we are by our name, but what happens when entire families are ripped apart? You can't do that. You don't have the ability to trace back who you are, and oftentimes that's why ancestry DNA and all these things are so popular because we want to know where we come from and we want to understand who we are. But the similar similar situation to what happened in the Americas happened or in in the United States happened in in Latino America, where indigenous communities were also torn apart. And you saw the transatlantic slave trade uh, map where massive amounts, 95% of individuals who were enslaved in Africa were taken to the Americas, that exact same thing happened. And so this whole notion of historical misrep misrepresentation and exploitation has occurred across the Americas, but we're often only taught one side, which is within the United States. So when I started looking at this literature, I wanted to see what my role was within, this, within um, perpetrating these lies, and that's why I started looking more into um, discriminatory policies and how these discriminatory policies are being played out in the United States today. So cities are becoming more diverse, but hyper-segregated. And so even though schools have been desegregated, right, legally desegregated, they're becoming segregated through SES. So now through neighborhoods, through social economic status. So we see hyper segregation in a lot of the communities. They're even more segregated than they have been in past years, especially in urban epicenters. Historical redlining, we still see the effects of historical redlining to this day where you will cross the street and go to schools that are better funded and have better teachers and have better resources and less student enrollment. And so yes, children who go to these schools, 
are going to perform because they have the support at their schools, but, their ex but children across the way are expected to do the same with much, with much less. So I wanted to understand and connect the dots between the legacy of colonization, policies such as miscegenation, such as racism within our legal system, even though we say that it's supposed to be um, arbitrary, or that it's, that it's supposed to be, um, uh, what's the word? Um, unbiased, right? It's, it's, it's often not. So then thinking about schooling and policy, deculturalization has happened to every minoritized community. And deculturalization, Spring says, is the stripping children of their culture and replacing it with the dominant groups. And so I talked a little bit about how my experience was also shaped and formed and the reason why I do this research. The reason why I do this research is because I want my children to know that they're Afro-Latinos that they're Haitians and that they should be proud of who they are. So understanding who they are and where you come from gives you voice, but above all, it gives you a strong foundation to be able to stand on. And so when someone tells you lies, Christopher Columbus, my, have, my daughter is in first grade, and so I taught, her, I told her, I taught her about Christopher Columbus, and she created a booklet and she took it to her teacher and she said, "This is the real story of Christopher Columbus." And what is her teacher going to say? No, that's not true. So her teacher sent me a message and she said, thank you for empowering your daughter to do that. And so now we have to be able to understand that the history and what's happening today matters, right? And so for our younger kids and for all of us to be able, for, as educators, to be able to understand that history continues to impact how we see ourselves, how I see myself within uh, a group full of people versus how my students see themselves. So in my classroom, what I do, I speak Spanish. I teach in Texas, I decided to teach in Texas because I love speaking Spanish and that was denied from me. My name, Claudia Garcia Lewis, I introduce myself like that all the time. And at first I was really shy, right? Deculturalization happened to me, they took my name, they made me feel ashamed of being bilingual, right? And I didn't have anything proud to stand on because I felt that I was inferior because my educational system taught me that I was inferior. And so part of my process and going through this research is also trying to understand where I lie. So now as a professor, I have the opportunity to force, because students are in there and they have to take the class, right? Force conversations about the history. When we have these conversations, there's resistance, but resistance also means that there is some sort of insecurity talking about it. When we talk about race and racism and colorism and prejudice, these are heavy topics. When we talk about historical discrimination, that's painful for both people who are benefiting from it, but then also for people whose families have endured it. And so coming to this notion of perpetual foreigners, it doesn't matter who you are if you, even Native Americans, feel this notion of being perpetual foreigners. Indigenous peoples to this land feel like they're foreigners, like they don't belong, like they're on someone else's land. Because when we feel powerless, we feel like guests who don't have rights. And so I wanted to understand how our schooling reinforces this notion of being perpetual foreigners. And you know, being raised as a, in a traditional Mexicana household, my parents always said, you don't question the teacher. The teacher knows best. And so when my, my teachers would send notes to, to my parents, Claudia is doing this or is not doing this, um, my parents would, and I would say like, no, papi, I did everything. I was in ESL till I was in fifth grade but I learned how to speak English in the United States. I immigrated when I was four, but I was in ESL when I was in fifth grade. And so when I would tell my parents, I don't want to go to that class. Like, I don't learn anything. I know how to open the door, close the door. That's the window. Like, I knew all that stuff. And the teacher would say, no, we still need to keep her here. And my parents would say, Claudia, you don't question the teachers. They know best for you. Researchers took those experiences and they said Latino parents are disengaged they're not involved in their children's education. They don't want to be involved in what's going on in the classroom. And you see how these cultural translations, right, where parents are 
respecting the teacher gets interpreted through someone's perspective as not wanting to be involved in your children's education. So I do this with my students. I encourage them and push them to have these difficult conversations. And I bring in scholarship that rejects this notion of deculturalization. And we know that diversity benefits whom? Mostly white, middle class individuals because they come from more homogeneous communities than people of color do. And so we know that affirmative action has benefited mostly white women. But then we're told when we're a person of color and we're walking through campus that we are the affirmative action case. And so I push my students to think about what that means for them, but then also what it means for the students that they will be teaching, because I teach in a program for, uh, in higher education program. And every single interaction that you have with students and every single interaction that you have with parents and community members will forever inform how they see themselves in relation to education. This is a matter of life or death, and I'm not just saying it because it sounds good. It really is, it's people's livelihoods. When someone is discouraged from coming back to the classroom, you're not only impacting them, you're impacting their future families, and their grandchildren because they will be able to see the possibilities. And so when we're forced to believe that we're foreigners, perpetual foreigners, right, in every single space we inhabit, if we're perpetual foreigners and we never feel like we belong or that we're good enough, that impacts how we are, how we feel, and how we speak. I used to be petrified, petrified. I used to, my heart would like pound out of my chest every time I had to talk in class. I hated to talk in class. Even as a doctoral student, I hated to talk in class. I was scared because my first language was Spanish. I was scared to read out loud because I didn't want to mess up. But most of all, I was scared of what others would think of me. I didn't want to speak in a way that made my voice be scared, right? So like that, uh, you know, where you can't breathe. It's scary. And even now, I get questioned <laughs> when, I, when I talk. In class, students push back. People push back. Oh, uno más. Um, and so that's called the imposter, um, the imposition of identity, um, but the imposter syndrome. We have been imposed onto us this notion of being imposters and not being able to be in spaces that were designed to keep us out. So Dubois, one of the most important thought scholars in our, in our history, um, said, the problem of the 20, 20th century is the problem of the color line. The question as to how far differences of race, which show themselves chiefly in the color of the skin and the texture of the hair, will hereafter be made the basis of denying to over half the world the right of sharing the utmost ability, the opportunities, and privileges of modern civilization. And so many philosophers can, have continued to quote this. But Alkoff, who's a, who's a brilliant scholar, said, if Dubois were alive today, he'd probably tell us that the problem of the 21st century will prove to be the lines between communities of color or the question to cross ethnic relations. And so what I'm here to do today and to challenge, and, and you know, in the spirit of, of MLK, MLK not only brought together communities from across the board, but he walked across and joined brown communities. So the March on Washington has been in history. It's a, it, it was an important march. But what we don't hear about was how he reached over to Gilberto Gerna Valentin and gave him 15 minutes to speak to the Latino community, but he asked him to speak in Spanish. These are examples of black and brown bridging one another. Cesar Chavez is a historical figure for the Latino community, and MLK sent him numerous telegraphs when, when Cesar Chavez was um, on hunger strikes and leading efforts in California for farm workers. And one of, the, one of the quotes that I love said, our separate struggles are really one, a struggle for freedom, for dignity, and for humanity. 
And so when we think about MLK bringing people together and celebrating MLK, I know many of us marched, but then we forget once we leave that march that the real work is bridging together minoritized, marginalized communities so that we see each other through our, unif through our, through our mutual um, experiences of, of rejection and hardships. Finally, People's March, he was assassinated prior to, before the People's March, but he called upon Chicano movement organizers and he said, we need to build, we need to bridge our communities. Please organize and let's get us all out there. And so um, Bert Corona, Corky Gonzalez, and Reyes Tejerina were, were the prominent figures of the Chicano movement and MLK reached out to them. So, I, you know, as it's MLK week, social media feeds are filled with MLK and, and, and all of the things that he has done. He, he visited Puerto Rico and, and was also um, um, uh, an ally to the Puerto Rican cause. And we know Puerto Rico has been on the news lately for, for many things. But what MLK did is what Alcoff said we needed to do. We need to bridge the black and brown communities, marginalized communities. And so I want to end with this quote, because I know my time is up. Um, in the spirit of MLK, when we look at modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit, which stands in glaring contrast with a scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to fly the air as birds. We've learned to swim the seas as fish, yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. And so this notion of unity, we can't have unity without understanding history. And we can't understand history without having difficult conversations about who we are and what we represent in the now. And so I did not ask to be born who I am, but I do have the obligation to make space for individuals who don't get into spaces that I am in. And so that, I think, is the legacy of MLK, is making sure that we create spaces for people who do not have access to those spaces. It's not about talking for them. It's about making sure that every single thing we do, we're bridging gaps, and we're making sure we build bridges rather than building walls. Thank you so much.